This week we're looking at virtual reality as a training tool and personal transport, a brand new product to help you get around. When the world of virtual reality arrived in the way it is today, uh, we looked at a whole bunch of different ways that we could use the technology to better the community. Obviously, there was, there was video games, there was communication, but one of the areas which has been growing in popularity of late is training, training different areas of the community to do things better. Now, one of the companies on the forefront of this uh, exploration, if you like, is Real Response. They're a training company that has begun or adapted virtual reality to assist the way they train people. And Modi Bloom is the co-founder and CEO of Real Response. How are you, Modi? Hey, Charlie. Yeah, I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, good. So VR as a training tool. To uh, just, just sort of stepping back for a minute, how, how much further does it help you take training than not having access to the technology? Basically, it, it allows us to, to simulate anything and um, it, it allows you know, teachers and educators and trainers to immerse students into any environment and allow them to practice whatever skills they're learning uh, in that um, simulated environment that can actually be quite realistic. Um, so it's an incredibly powerful tool to use in education. Um, we've been using simulation in uh, ourselves for a long time and simulation is not a new thing, um, but VR really allows you to, to scale those simulations and, and expose more and more people to those simulations. Every year the technology improves. We've gone from uh, the earlier days of having a cable plugged in uh, to the headset to having a wireless headset, uh, backpacks that we can walk around the room, um, um, basically uh, uh, all sorts of sensors that we'd have to be in a particular location of to essentially no sensors. How has the advancement of the technology actually helped you with improving the, 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 the training that you're doing? Oh, it's made a massive difference. Um, I mean, VR as a, as a training tool has been around for decades even. Um, we ourselves, you know, got involved in this space in around, you know, four or five years ago. And even in the last, in that period of time, it has come a hell of a long way. And as you said, Charlie, initially, um, you know, we were using headsets that had to be tethered to a, a gaming computer, a powerful gaming computer. You needed to set up um, tracking devices around the room. Um, and it was also very expensive because not only did you have to purchase the headset, but you also needed to purchase a, a powerful computer to be able to uh, facilitate um, the use of that headset. So now we're using a standalone device that doesn't require a computer, that doesn't have any setup that you can, that's literally, um, you know, you literally put it on your head and, and you're immersed into another world. There's no cables. Um, so it makes a huge difference, uh, both in terms of ease of use and then also in terms of cost. Um, because as a training tool, um, often VR is best suited to scenarios where you're training lots and lots of people. Um, and it's not um, cost effective if you have to purchase, you know, multiple computers and multiple tethered headsets and being able to purchase a device like the Oculus Quest or something like that that is wireless and that, you know, only costs about 600 bucks, it really allows you to scale that training to through a large organisation. Part of the cost of training as well is having access to the student. Uh, if you are trying to train people who are not uh, in the, the location where you are, you have to either get the student to the location to train them or you have to get the, the mechanism of training to the student. I would imagine sending a, a, a set of goggles out to somebody telling them, giving them some instructions on how to put it on and then join the training uh, regime would be a potential opportunity. Yeah, exactly. And look, the the notion of being able to train remotely is not a new thing. I mean, we've all been, we've all done, you know, heaps of e-learning packages and, and, you know, universities are using remote learning and especially during this period, 
we've seen um, you know schools and all sorts of organizations adapt and, and start using remote training in different ways I think um, what VR does is it allows it gives you the um, the scalability of something like e-learning um, and the accessibility of it but it, it drastically increases the quality of that training so whereas in e-learning you know you're kind of limited by being able to show some videos and maybe ask a few multiple choice questions and you know short answer questions um, in VR you can actually immerse people in a real world scenario so as an example you know we've um, we've done a lot of um, training for paramedics um, and one scenario that we've, we've done a lot of work on is mass, mass casualty training. So what, what does a paramedic do when they come to the scene of a terrorist attack and you've got 15 casualties there? So previously we've run that scenario as a real world scenario where we'll have actors, we'll have fake blood, we'll have smoke, we'll have all sorts of sound effects and other props to try and bring that scenario to life. Um, the challenge is to run that is incredibly expensive. And, and as you said, Charlie, you've got to bring people to that scenario and you've got to kind of run it over and over again, um, which you know can cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. Whereas with VR, we can effectively, and we have recreated that scenario in a virtual environment. And as you said, we're able to send out the headset to people and they can go through a very similar experience from the comfort of their home. You don't make the hardware, but do you make the software? Do you write... The software, do you use somebody else's platform uh, to begin the process and finish it off? I mean, what's your involvement on that front? Yeah, so we def definitely don't make the hardware. Um, and we do, we have our own um, development team based in Melbourne. Um, but we use a, a gaming engine called Unity, um, which um, I think some of your viewers may be familiar with, mm. um, which I think don't, uh, I'm nervous saying this uh, on TV here, but I, I think it powers around 60, 70% of the world's games, something like that. Um, so it's a commonly used gaming platform. Um, and yeah, we have our development team in, in Melbourne and, and 3D artists who, who build out those scenarios. And virtual reality as a technology, a lot of people are comfortable with it. Some people aren't. Um, there's plenty of videos around on the internet of people who put on VR goggles for the first time, for example, and all of a sudden they're falling over, they're feeling dizzy. How do you get around those kinds of scenarios? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably dispute what you said. I would say a lot of people, I'm not sure that a lot of people are comfortable with it. We find that most people we, we introduce it to, this. it's their first time and mm. they, they do struggle a little bit with it on that first occasion. Um I think it, it really comes down to the ex, what experience people are going through in virtual reality. So I think a lot of people's uh, first experience with VR is a 360 video experience, 360 degree video. For, for those that don't know what that is, it's effectively instead of a two-dimensional video, um, it's a video that's 360 degrees. It either uses a camera that has you know lenses pointing in different directions or that spins around very fast. Um, and many people have 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 gone through like the the YouTube uh, 360 uh, roller coaster ride um, and the challenge with that is that um, you've you, you're moving very fast in that virtual environment but you're um, in the real world you're actually standing still and that can make people feel quite nauseous um, what we do is um, our, our scenarios are not 360 video they're all animated so they're more like a computer game type experience that people would be familiar with um, and we're really mindful of just trying to make sure that um, the way the user moves in VR is similar to the way they're moving in the real world. Um, and then if they do have to move a longer distance, instead of just um, moving them in VR whilst they're still stagnant in the real world, we'll use something called teleporting, which is basically just jumping. So the frame kind of stops and they move to the next spot, which really helps reduce um, nausea in VR experiences. And then the other big thing is the, as technology has evolved and frame rates have increased and things like that, um, it's really reduced those issues around nausea uh, in VR. How far can you go? Because you mentioned training paramedics, for example, um, and those kinds of things. I mean, where do you see the ability to train people using VR technology going over the next five years? Because I imagine if you, if you sort of crack this nut you will be able to move into a whole bunch of areas where where you can now train people that you've never considered training before. 
Yeah, I mean, look, that's the beauty of VR, that that anything's possible, the sky's the limit. Um, you know, if we want to simulate an alien invasion in, you know, Sydney um, on, on the Harbour Bridge, we could do that in VR, which would probably be <laughs> difficult to simulate in the real world. Um, so really anything's possible. I think, I think the questions that we're asking ourselves as a training provider is we want to make sure that there's a value in using VR, that it's actually in, enhancing the quality of training. So as an example, we do a lot of first aid training um, and, you know, we've toyed with the idea a lot, should we be using VR to train first aid? And the conclusion we've come to at the moment, and this might change, but at the moment is that actually using a mannequin and using some basic props like, um, you know, a bit of fake blood and some smells and sound effects and stuff like that is actually more effective than using VR. Um, so we haven't created a CPR scenario within VR because we actually think you can do a really good job of simulating that in a in a scalable and affordable way in the real world. So I think the big question is we're looking, we're trying to identify areas that are challenging to train in the real world. They're challenging to scale. Uh, it's expensive to scale them where and, and areas where there's current deficiencies in the quality of the training. And they're the areas that we're trying to bring, utilize VR to try and solve those problems. Um, I do think, and as you alluded to in, in the question, I think VR is going to become more and more common in, in all sorts of education and training. Um, and because I think it's just such a powerful tool and, and that ability to be able to immerse a learner in a, an environment without putting them in, in any risk um, at, at minimal cost um, at any time, at any place, I think that's going to be something that's going to be utilised by all sorts of education providers in, in the years to come. Well, one thing that is for sure, the quality of the VR technology is not stopping. It keeps uh, jumping forward at a great speed and we look forward to seeing what happens there. It's great to see uh, or get an insight into how this technology is helping train future experts in their respective field. Moddy Bloom, our CEO, co-founder of Real Response, great to have a chat to you today. Thank you for taking us through all of that. Thanks, Charlie. If you've ever wanted an outdoor television, Samsung now have you covered with their latest model, the Terrace. Designed to give you the best entertainment experience outside, all of Samsung's latest TV technology is packed inside. The Terrace provides brilliant picture all day and night with direct full array and quantum dot technology a 200 hertz refresh rate for smooth motion and wide viewing angles for a great view no matter where your seat is. While the outdoor elements can be unforgiving, it's designed for weather resistance with an IP55 rating to help protect it from water and dust. It must be installed under a roof cover, but it is designed to be safe against the occasional spray of rain. For added safety, a dust cover is included for when the TV is not in use. It's not only a high quality screen for outside, but it's packed with smart features that allow you to take your entertainment with you, from streaming your favourite services to mirroring content from your devices or even using the inbuilt voice assistant to control your content. Well, if you've ever ridden an electronic scooter, you'll know how much fun can be had, but also how efficient they can be for personal transport. There's a bunch of brands that are in the market, but one of the brands that's doing some really cool stuff is Segway. And Mr. Jeff Quattromani has been trialing a Segway solution. How are you, sir? Good, Charlie, how are you? Good. Now, there's a lot to learn when it comes with electronic scooters. I mean, they've got different programs in different parts of the world where you can book or ride an electronic scooter off the street pay for it on a minute by minute basis. We're talking about ones that you actually buy and use at home, in the garden, in the street, that kind of thing though. Tell me about this one from Segway. All right, so this is the Segway Ninebot Kick Scooter Air T15. Bit of a long name, but mm. it must be the most space age, futuristic looking scooter I've ever seen. It's got this beautiful white and black design. You'd almost think that Steve Jobs was involved in the actual design of the, of the scooter, but uh, it was my first time riding an e-scooter. I have never been on one before. As a kid, I would have ridden a manual scooter where you had to use your legs to make it move. But here is one that you essentially push a button with your thumb to make it go. And boy, does it go. Is, is this one the 
sort of well thought out solution where you've got the caddy and you get home and you sort of put it in the dock, starts charging, you need to go out, you just pick it out of the dock and off you go. Is it the full solution? Look, to me it is. I want to call this the last mile type scooter where, you know, it actually fits into your car boot really easily. It folds to be almost flat once you've once you've done it and it unfolds in about a second. You literally push a button, lift the lever and this thing folds upright again. So I can imagine driving this a certain distance, driving the car a certain distance, pulling it out of the boot, jumping on the scooter and going that last mile. I'm, the other way that I've been thinking about using this is taking it from my home to the train station uh, folding it up and you can actually cart it almost like luggage onto the train. And then once you get off the train, you take it that last mile to the office as well. And once you're at the office, you can recharge it if you have to, but you've got about 25 kilometers of actual battery range mm. in the scooter itself. So maybe not. 25 kilometers is a long way. I mean, look, to be honest, I think if you're going that far, that's something you, where you'd probably be choosing an alternate form of transport right there's probably a more two to three kilometer bridging solution between you and the train station bus station uh or bus stop uh is that the feeling you got from it too uh it is so i I wouldn't ever recommend anybody stand on this thing for for 20 kilometers i actually think you'd get quite uncomfortable doing that Uh, but in short bursts even if it's a small trip to the shops um you know getting to the office things like that it's it's that perfect solution it's certainly much faster than walking with you know, speeds up to 20 kilometers an hour, uh, it's very fast. So you do need to be paying attention to that brake because you can manually brake as well as electronically brake as well. So uh, a really interesting experience on this e-scooter. The thing about e-scooters is they're very different to the electronic bike or the supported uh, bike that you ride because not all states in Australia allow these things to be ridden. What's the What's the... The, the, the mashup with legal side of things with this thing. Okay, so if you're in New South Wales, you probably don't want to rush out to go and buy one of these just yet. Uh, the reality what, is, is that the law on, in New why South Wales... Is it, why is it that New South Wales is such a nanny state when it comes to anything like this, right? You, there's, there's rules around radio control cars that you can drive and, and driving one of those in in a, a dead end street, for example, there's rules around electronic skateboards, electronic scooters. Basically, you can't do any of it. It's crazy. And and I, this actually is crazy because essentially we're talking about a scooter. I mean, yes, it can go up to 20 kilometers an hour, but I'll tell you what, if I jump on a manual scooter with a few good pushes, I might hit that speed myself anyway. Mm. Um, and here we are saying that in New South Wales, in public places, you're actually not allowed to ride an e-scooter. You can ride a manual scooter, you can ride a push bike, you can even ride an e-bike. But an e-scooter in particular is being singled out here. And if you've got one in New South Wales, you can use it in your driveway, on your private property, but definitely not anywhere else. And this isn't to do with wearing a helmet or having a registration or anything like that. It's just a flat out ban on e-scooters at the moment. Other states in Australia, a lot more lenient, If you're in Queensland, jump on one, have a good time. If you're in South Australia, there are trials in place at the moment. And if you're in Victoria, there is also a way that you can ride them at a certain speed as well. So at least the other states seem to be doing something. But New South Wales, it seems crazy to me at the moment. I love this kind of personal transportation because it enables the use of public transport so much more because it's often that last mile uh, from the home to the bus stop to the train station, for example, that stops people from engaging in public transport. The, the hill is too steep, for example, or or it's yeah. just a bit too far that makes walking in those kinds of scenarios too uncomfortable for people, especially going to and from work. These kinds of things provide a solution. It's exactly it. I mean, we're coming into summer. That last mile from the train station to the office could mean you turning up as a sweaty mess to the office. But if you're standing on a scooter, hitting about 20 kilometers now, you've got the, the breeze in your hair. It actually feels really beautiful. Mm. And you may actually turn up to the office earlier than expected and still looking as good as you were when you left home. So, you know, I, I think it's a crazy thing to be having these smart cities that we're trying to build, but also on the other hand, not enabling the use of, of e-scooters. To me, especially Sydney, it makes more sense than ever. Well, at my house, I have a very long driveway, so I can most certainly ride it back up and down on that and have a great time with it from a from a enjoying around the home perspective, but definitely not as a 
uh, solution for public transport, which is really, really what this thing's going to be. Um, what kind of price are we looking at? Okay, so you're looking at twelve nine nine for this particular one. There are cheaper models out there, but I think when you when you look at this and you see just how beautiful it is, mm. um, you can sort of see why you have got that premium cost. The, the speed is not uncommon. The, the range certainly is. I think it's got more range than a lot of other competitors in the market. Uh, and the other thing to mention too is you've got a 15% um, percent hill grade that it can handle. Not all e-scooters will manage to get you up a hill. Uh, in testing with this one, yes, it can get you up most hills within reason. You may need to actually give it a push every now and then. Well, that's not so bad. The, the thing about going cheap scooters or cheap e-bikes or cheap sca uh, electronic skateboards is the lower down the purchase scale you go, the less quality of the battery or the size of the battery, the less quality of the motor. And they're the two things that are absolutely crucial to have a good long-term experience with these things, right? So I don't, I don't think 1200 and over 1200 bucks is, um, is, is outrageous at all for a good quality product, especially one that meets Australian standards as well. And that's the other thing. You can import something from overseas mm -hmm. and if it doesn't meet Australian standards, remember all those hoverboards where they imported them from overseas and lost a few houses funnily enough, with those things. So it yeah. um, can be Absolutely. quite dangerous. Jeff, good to have a chat. Good to look at this one. We'll look at some more of these kinds of products over the coming weeks. Appreciate your time today. We'll chat to you next week. Thank you, Charlie. Swan, who virtually make a camera for every kind of home or business, is now releasing a Wi-Fi tracker security solution. It's an indoor camera with some very clever technology. This is a multi-award winning compact indoor security camera that uses auto tracking technology to record moving objects without physically moving the camera. Up to two objects can be tracked at once while simultaneously viewing the full 180 degree ultra wide field of vision using the Swan security app. With new features like auto tracking and auto zoom, any suspicious activity can be easily recorded and tracked by the camera with excellent visual quality. Got a question this week about cloning your drive on a PC or a Mac. Now, the, the question basically wants to know what's the best software to use. Now, there's a million different kinds of drive cloning software programs that are out there. There are free versions and there are commercially purchased versions. The, the ones you pay for, they have more features. The free ones work most of the time. Uh, the one that I use is Mini Tool Shadow Make, and I've used that one quite successfully on a number of different uh, duplications of drives. Very convenient. If you've never done this before, what it allows you to do is take the, the C drive that you've got on your computer and uh, duplicate it to make a bigger drive if you want to expand the storage capacity. But it also is very good as well if you're wanting to take the C drive and duplicate it into a solid state drive, which will make your PC performance so much better. That's the use that I have done the bulk of times with uh, with a software uh, tool like this one. So um, we will put the link to this one in the comments section, but it is called Mini Tool Shadow Maker. Check it out. And uh, it's a free version, a free way to duplicate your drives for your PC. This is Jamie, the touchscreen device delivering your favorite streaming entertainment. It's smart, safe, and fits in your pocket. You'll notice that Jamie has no cameras, as this is an entertainment device. Every Jamie has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi connectivity, a 5-inch plastic touchscreen, FM radio receiver, and a 2,200 milliamp hour battery. We've also included basic parental controls allowing you to pin lock the apps and settings on every Jamie. Don't know the pin? Then you can't open the app. There are three versions of Jamie. Jamie, Jamie Plus, and Jamie Connect. Jamie is perfect for listening to apps like Spotify and Apple Music with limited distractions. Jamie Plus has the same hardware but is a Google-registered device. 
So we've pre-installed some Google services like YouTube, Google Maps, and Chrome. And you can download and install your favorite apps via the Google Play Store. Jimmy Connect is just like the Jimmy Plus, but with 4G connectivity. Your Jimmy Connect will stream your favorite entertainment via Wi-Fi and 4G, make and receive calls, and also text. With Jimmy Connect, we've included the ability to personalize the incoming and outgoing call and SMS experience using our preloaded call block. Block or approve incoming calls and SMS traffic as you decide. Find your Jimmy, a safer smart device. Thanks very much for joining us this week and to our guests, of course, questions, comments in the comment section, and we'll see you again next week for more Cyber Shack Live.